Abracadabra. 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 <laughs> Abracadabra. What? Wait a Abra- Kurt, Kurt, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying my magic words. I'm Abracadabra. They're, they're not you working, joking, Tim. What, what? You don't believe in magic? Not that type of magic. No. <laughs> well, then, Aveda Kavara. Aveda Kavara. <laughs> what the what the hell is that? I don't think I've ever even heard that. that that's the <laughs> killing curse from Harry Potter. Yeah, oh. I guess I guess I need a wand. It doesn't work. I need a wand. <laughs> and I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it didn't work, right? <laughs> okay. All right. While I might not believe in these fairy tale kind of magic words that you're talking about, I do believe in magic words. Uh, the idea that words have power to influence and change our behavior. Yeah, I believe okay. in that. Okay, so I'm glad then that the the killing curse didn't work, Tim, because we're Thanks. we're aligned around that. We are we are very very much aligned that you know, words have power and there's some magic in that. Yeah, totally. And we're aligned with our guest today as well, Jonah Berger. Now, Jonah is a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and he's an international bestseller. Yes, and we had the pleasure of talking with him today about his new book, Magic Words, What Mm -hmm. to Say to Get Your Way. And for listeners who don't know, this is the second time that we've had Jonah on the show. And once again, he did not disappoint. We got 30 minutes with him, and it was a fantastic discussion. No, he did not disappoint. And we talked through uh, a lot of different aspects around language that uh, we can use to make that language more impactful. From looking at concreteness versus abstract word choices to speak framework, that is S-P-E-A-C-C, not uh, S-P-E-A-K, right? right? And anyway, um, to using the right amount of similarity versus distinctiveness in your conversations. So much to learn. And as always, we invite you, our supporters, nay, our advocates, to share this episode with others or start a conversation with us on social media. We want to hear from you, Groovers. You're not just Groovers. You are advocates. You are sharers. You are commenters. You are initiators. What do you think about our magic words? (laughs) So the magic word here is at behavioral groove that is <laughs> behavioral groove spelt without the e or the s at the end uh-huh. which is what makes it so magical tim it's that, that without the e and s so because uh, if you use that on twitter that's how you can connect with us the uh-huh. insiders that you are and you mm-hmm. can magically follow us on twitter and join the convex conversation like really good advocates do it would just be magic if you'd follow us. How about that? Just to pull, pull, pull this pun one more time. And so with that, we ask you to sit back with your favorite magical spirited potion and enjoy our conversation with Jonah Berger. Jonah Berger, welcome back to Behavioral Groups. Thanks so much for having me back. It's good to see you, and uh, looking like a 16th century Dutch master painting, I think this is fantastic. <laughs> I wish our viewers could see you, but we're going to get started with a speed round. So, beer, wine, or spirits? What's what's your preference? Spirits. Ooh. Yeah. And anything within? Are you, have you become, are you on the bourbon train these days? You know, I am not uh, an aficionado of any of the above, but I find that um, uh, beer and wine tend to make me slippy, sleepy and uh, liquor makes me happier. So I, I picked that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. All okay. right. Second, second speed round question. If you could have a conversation with any dead scientist or philosopher, who would you pick? Oh, God, that's a really tough one. Um, You know, I'm going to pick a boring answer. I'm going to go with Albert Einstein, um, not just because he was a great scientist, but um, I often see him quoted saying things that I think reveal a deep understanding of human behavior. He he once said, you know, if you, uh, you know, don't under, can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Yeah. Um, And and that stuck with me. So I'm going to go with him. That's really interesting because I have the same feeling. It's like not only is he just a fantastic mind in, in, you know, physics and other things, but there is that insight that he, at least according to the, the quotes and if they're real, yes. but you know, they're, they're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty insightful. So yes, indeed. 
Okay, so a uh, third speed round question. If you want to get people to vote, is it better to just say, go vote or be a voter? Oh, that, that one's easy. That's straight out of the book. Be a voter. <laughs> I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> All right. Well, and, and we'll, we'll probably get into come that a little bit more. But I have, I have the last speed round question. So, and, and again, it, hopefully you'll, you'll get this because we, we took it from your book. So if, if I worry that if I ask for advice from a peer or a coworker or my boss, that they might think less of me, that somehow I couldn't figure it out on my own, I'm not that smart, maybe I'm just annoying them, is that a good belief to hold or is that a false belief? False belief. Asking, asking for advice is actually beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And why? So let, let's, let, let's oh, just good. jump I, right I, in. We, we can get out of the speed round. Okay, I was We're trying out to be speed speed speed. Move on to speed round. answer the long yeah. form here. Yeah, good. So, you know, I think we all have this intuition um, that that asking for advice is a, is 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 not a good thing, right? We uh, we're stuck on a tough problem. We can't solve something. We think about somebody who might be able to help us, but we say, well, you know, maybe they're too busy, or maybe they won't know the answer. Even if they know the answer, worst of all, they'll perceive us negatively, right? If we go ask them for advice, they'll think we don't know what we're doing. That we don't, uh, we're not very smart. We're not very competent. You know, particularly in a work context, but even a personal context. We, we may not ask. Um, and uh, it turns out that's a mistake. So some, some really nice research had people have a variety of different conversations and interact with a variety of others. Um, some of those people asked for advice and some didn't. Um, and what they found was that asking for advice doesn't actually make us seem less competent or less knowledgeable. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It makes us seem more competent and, and more knowledgeable. And so you might say, well, well, why, right? Why would asking for advice make us seem more knowledgeable? And the interesting thing is people love thinking they give good advice. All of us think we give good advice. We're all, we're all egocentric. And so when someone else comes along and asks us for advice, we go, wow, you clearly have such good taste because of all the people <laughs> you could have asked for advice. You picked, you picked me. Um, and so as a result, they think we're more competent, right? They think, they think we have good, good taste. And so not only should we ask her advice for all the other reasons it allows us to get information and all those things, but it actually makes us be perceived more positively as a, as a result. Yeah. You, you, you talk in the book about abstract versus concrete words. C can you, could you just do a little bit of explanation about this abstract versus concrete? Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, is it okay if I tell a little bit of a story? Of course. Right okay. Ahead. Wonderful. So uh, <laughs> a, a number of years ago, um, I'm in uh, uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, on my way back to the airport um, from a consulting project. When I get I get that text message that every traveler dreads, you know, your your flight has been delayed or canceled or whatever whatever it is. So I call up the airline, uh, trying to get some help, trying to get rebooked on a, a better flight rather than the terrible one they have me booked on. After a 10 minute frustrating experience where they they say they care about me, but I'm stuck on hold, and you know the person says they want to help, but they're not helpful. I get off the call even more frustrated than I started. My very nice Uber driver says, oh, you know, it sounds like you were talking to customer service. I say, yeah, you know, tough job they must have. Everybody like me is just complaining all day. And they say, actually, my, my daughter works in customer service. She loves it. And she's so good at it. They now have her training other agents. And I sit there as the behavioral scientist me goes, you know, what, what is she doing that makes her so <laughs> right. effective? Exactly. Right. Cause you know, we, and, and we why all, didn't you get that experience. <laughs> uh, well, yes, yes. But you know, we, we, when we call customer service, we want our problem solved, right? We, we think that that's the only reason we call. We want, um, you know, the flight not to be delayed, the bags to be found. We want a bigger credit, whatever it might be. We don't think the language matters very much, but it turns out that it, that it does. And so, uh, with a colleague, Grant Packard and I, we analyzed, um, across different retail and situations, over a thousand customer service interactions with airlines, with retailers, with a variety of different things. And we found that controlling for the solving the problem and all these other things, the language you use matters. And in particular, the concreteness of the language you use matters. Now, you might say, well, what, is, what does concreteness mean? What is, what is concreteness? Well, tables uh, are concrete, um, uh, chairs are concrete, doors are concrete, windows are concrete, food is concrete. Things you can taste, touch, and see are concrete. Things like love, things like happiness are much more abstract ideas. We can't touch them, we can't feel them, and so they're, they're harder to imagine. And so it turns out that using more concrete language increases customer satisfaction. So if someone calls rather than saying, uh, oh, you know, your refund will be there soon, saying your money will be there tomorrow, well, tomorrow is much more concrete than soon. I don't know when soon is, but I know when, when tomorrow is. Um, refund sounds abstract. Money is really concrete. Um, makes people more satisfied with with that interaction. 
And the reason why actually goes much beyond customer service. So often as communicators, we want other people to, to feel like we're listening, right? Mm-hmm. Whether we're a boss in a meeting, whether we're a customer service agent, listening is, is key, but it's not just about listening, it's about showing that we're listening. And that's exactly what concrete language does because it shows people not only we heard what they said, we understood what they said, but we care enough to, to listen and show them by being, by being concrete. And so concrete language shows listening and as a result uh, makes people more, more satisfied and, and happy with interaction. Wow. I, I, I love that. Love and that. I'm going to put you on, on the spot here and just hypothetically, Perfect. hypothetically, say I'm trying to sell a, a 13 week guided journal based on behavioral science that can help people achieve their goals by journaling every day using scientifically designed prompts that were researched and vetted by behavioral scientists and a team of them, would it be better for me to describe the journal? And again, think about this journal. You're helping people achieve their goals, kind of more abstract kind of visions that they have, but they're doing it very concretely daily kind of thing. So would it be better for me to describe the journal in concrete terms or abstract terms, or is it some mix of the two? Yeah, good. And, 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 and so, you know, in general, if you want people to understand something, if you want them to understand it, if you want them to remember it, if you want them to feel like you're listening, concrete, and those are different outcomes, but, but concrete language is better, right? It's easy to imagine what something is if it's concrete. You know, you could walk through the steps, for example. Rather than saying at a high level, you know, journaling will help you achieve these goals, each day by writing down X, Y, Z, you are going to be more likely to very specifically what, what the outcome is. Concreteness helps us imagine, helps us understand, can, can be good. That said, there's concrete language isn't always better, right? So there are yep. some situations where being abstract is actually good. If I'm a, if I'm a leader, for example, and I, I come in and I'm too concrete, people understand what I'm saying, but they won't think I'm that visionary, right? Because abstract is, is actually about high level. Concreteness is, is low level. Similarly, research on um, uh, startups raising money finds that actually using abstract language helps startups raise more money in, the, in their pitches. Why would being abstract in your pitch be good? Well, if I say, hey, I'm, uh, you know, my company's going to help you get from your uh, home to your office, uh, so, uh, you know, get, you, get you from your home to your office. That's, I understand exactly what that is. I know what you do, but it doesn't sound that big. Or if I say, hey, my company's a transportation solution, I have no idea what you do, but it seems like there are a lot of possibilities. And so when you want it to seem open-ended and broad and possible, use more abstract language. When you want people to understand and remember or feel like you're listening, concrete language is better. I'm curious, how, share with our listeners how you, you did this, some of this research, because it's really fascinating. You talk about uh, this idea of analyzing all of these customer service interactions. I think that's just really amazing. To, to like, You didn't sit and listen to all these calls and take notes on them, right? Or did yeah, you? And, 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 that's, and that's what's so exciting about the age that we live in. There, there have been two trends that have kind of converged over the past, I'll say, you know, 15 years or so. The first is the availability of data, right? So, um, you know, go back 20 years, the customer service calls weren't even recorded. Mm. Um, uh, you know, they, they just didn't exist. Whereas today, language data is everywhere, right? We are having a conversation right now. At the end of this conversation, you may press a button and some software may transcribe the interaction, uh, we're having um, billions of consumers leads their attitudes and opinions and ideas online every day, right? On social media, on on blogs, on other places. You know, companies produce language through their advertisements. Employees produce language through their emails. Salespeople produce language through their pitches, and so much of this language has now been been captured and and digitized. But second, as you pointed out, even all that data would be great, but we need somebody to be able to do something with it, right? Listening to one customer service call takes time. Listening to 100 takes 100 times as long. Uh, it's effortful. It's subjective. Wouldn't it be nice if there are easier ways to do it? And there are, right? So advances in natural language processing, automated textual analysis, machine learning have allowed us to extract insights from, from language data. In this case, we worked with a big online retailer, an airline. Um, they anonymized some of these calls. We got them transcribed. And then we ran them through software that can measure the concreteness of the language, whether someone's using more abstract language or more concrete language, allowing us to score these interactions on that dimension. Um, I've looked at thousands of New York Times articles uh, to look at how uh, positive or negative the, the content is. I've looked at tens of thousands uh, of other types of online articles um, in a project to look at what holds attention to look at, well, how are they written, right? Are they using more familiar language or less familiar language, more concrete language or less concrete language? 
language that's likely to evoke anger versus anxiety. And so we both have access to language data and we can parse it in ways that have, have never been before been possible. Yeah, I think it's fascinating when you take all of that data that you have and have the processing power today, as you, you talked about, and, and are able to pull some of these um, insights out of it. With all of that data and all of that piece, uh, was there any research that talked about uh, do we tend to speak more in concrete or more in abstract or is it again dependent upon uh, our individual personalities? Is it dependent upon industries that we're in or the types of situations? What has the research shown about how we use the language and when it's used? You know, um, uh, there are some differences. There's also a lot of similarities. Um, uh, there's some gender differences, for example. So some research finds that uh, female startup founders uh, tend to speak a bit more concretely. Um, uh, and that's part of the, the reason that they actually don't raise as much money. Um, uh, while it makes what they're doing more understandable, um, it makes VCs uh, less likely to think it's a, a huge opportunity rather than just a sizable opportunity. Um, and so they invest uh, less money. So there, there certainly are some differences. But, but what I found most fascinating about working in this space is our ability to change these things. So mm. it's not that you know certain people are born better writers or born better speakers and the rest of us are just stuck. Right? If we understand how language works, if we understand the types of language and uh, when to use them and how to use them, we can increase our impact in almost every domain of life. We can be more persuasive. Uh, we can motivate ourselves and others. We can even deepen social connections with our loved ones by using language more, more effectively. And so to me, language is very much a tool. Um, uh, and this book is a toolkit that can help any of us be, be more successful. I think that's, that's really, you bring up the relationship stuff. And uh, could, you, could you share an example of where using a specific kind of language, whether it's more abstract or more concrete, can actually enhance a relationship? Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick on a category we haven't talked about yet, which is, is questions. And so mm -hmm. uh, I talk about six key types of magic words in, in the book. I put them in a framework called the SPEAK framework. Uh, the S is for similarity. The P is for posed questions. The E is for emotion. The A is for the language of agency and identity. Um, the first C is for the language of uh, concreteness. And the second C is for the language of, of confidence. And, and for those folks who are paying attention, they're probably going, well, wait, doesn't speak end with a, a K, not two, not two Cs. You are right. Um, in in uh, some languages, it does. <laughs> you, you are right. Um, I couldn't come up with a framework that ended with a K, um, though somebody pointed out in Scrabble that K is the most difficult language uh, letter to use, so I, I don't feel bad about that. Um, but uh, let's spend a second on posing questions. And so some, some really nice research looked at social interactions, a variety of types of social interactions. Everything from sort of speed dates to getting to know you conversations to sort of uh, office uh, conversation. Um, and they found that asking more questions led other people to like us more. So the more questions we asked, the more other people like us. But it wasn't just asking any type of question. There was a particular type of question that made people like us more. Um, and that type of, of question uh, is, is called, uh, are called follow-up questions. And so what do I mean by that? Well, Often we begin a conversation with a question. How are you today? How are you doing? Uh, you know, what's up? What's going on? That's not really a, a follow-up question. That's more of a kind of an introductory question. It shows we're polite, but not much more than that. There's another type of, of question called kind of a, a, it's almost like a mimicry question where somebody asks us a question, um, what are you doing for lunch? I'm doing this. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. it's, it's responding, but doesn't provide a lot of information. What follow-up questions do is they take what someone said and they dig deeper. So somebody said, oh, I really enjoyed that presentation. Rather than just saying, I did also, saying something like, oh, wow, what'd you enjoy about it? Someone says they have a tough day, not just saying, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, which is a nice thing to say, but saying, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What was, what was difficult about it, right? A, a question that shows, follow, what follow questions do is they show that you care. Similar to what we talked about with concrete language, how concrete language shows listening, um, because it shows that someone heard what you said and uh, is following up uh, on what you said rather than saying something general. Same thing with follow-up questions, right? They show that not only did someone hear what you said, uh, but they care enough to ask more. And so follow-up questions make people like us more because they show we're responsive, right? They show not only that we listen, but that we care and that we want to learn learn more. Let's go in. I love A, that that is a great example. But B, I want to kind of go, you you talk about the six different types. What about the agency and identity? How, how did that kind of words, and can you give us an example of that? Sure, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a quick one there. I think I talk about 
five or under, under each of these principles, there's kind of what the language yeah. is and, and four or five ways to apply it. I'll, I'll give you one example of, of agency and identity. Um, and so often we're trying to get others uh, to, to do something. We're asking people for help. Uh, if we work for a nonprofit, maybe we're asking people to go vote. There's some actions that we want people to take. And so we ask them to take uh, those actions. But it turns out that subtle shifts in the language we use can, can make it more likely that people say yes. So great old study that was done at Stanford University where they go to a local elementary school or preschool and they ask some students for help cleaning up. Mm-hmm. There's a mess on the floor, lots of books, crayons. They ask the students for, for help cleaning up the room. For some students, they say, hey, can you help clean up, as we often might ask others. And some people say, say yes, some people say no. But for another group of students, they try a different approach. They say, hey, can you be a helper? And this comes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier in the speed round. Being a helper is, is uh, the word helper is very similar to word help, only a couple letters added at the end, E-R. Let, it led to about a 30% increase in the percentage of people uh, who helped. And it's not just kids in classrooms. More recent research on voting found that rather than asking people to vote, ask them to be a voter led to about a 15% increase in the proportion of people that went ahead and voted. And so you might say, well, well, why? That seems like such a small difference, right? Just one letter or two letters difference. Why would that matter? But uh, what it does is it turns those actions into identities, right? We're all, we're all busy. We know we should vote. We know we should help. We don't always have the time. But what we care more about than taking a specific action is holding desired identities, right? Everyone wants to see themselves as smart and efficacious and uh, at least a little bit coordinated or whatever it might be. And so if someone tells us to take an action, fine. But if that action is an opportunity to claim a desired identity, well, now I'm much more likely to do it. Voting, yeah, I know I should vote. But if voting is an opportunity to be a voter, this desirable identity, well, now I'm more likely to go out and cast my ballot. If helping is an opportunity to be a helper, I'm more likely to do it. And so by turning actions into identities, we can make people more likely to take those, those actions, right? Rather than ask people to lead, ask them to be a, a leader, for example, right? That's a desirable trait. I want to show myself and others that I hold that trait. Uh, I'm more likely to take the action, right? Um, same even with ourselves. Uh, if I tell you about two people, imagine I have one friend who runs, and one friend who is a runner. If you had to guess, which of those two people runs more often? The runner does. Yeah. The runner, right? Because <laughs> uh, it sounds like a stable part of who they are. It's not just something they do once in a while. It's kind of who, who their identity is. Same if I, someone says I, or they're a coffee lover. They don't just drink coffee. They love coffee. It's who they are. And so by, by describing ourselves as a runner, well, now I, I better go running once in a while. If I'm a runner, that, that's part of who I am. I better do things that confirm that identity. Um, and so framing uh, actions in a, as an identities can be a great way to not only change others' behavior, but but change our own as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It, it, it can bring up that cognitive dissonance if I'm that my behaviors aren't matching what I'm describing myself as and therefore driving some of that motivation as you talk about. Yeah, we, we've interviewed Gary Latham a couple different times. And, and in one of the, the interviews we had and one of the research studies he did, he talked about achievement words. And I'm not sure if you're um, familiar with that research, but he did a where he changed uh, 12 words in a um, CEO's uh, Monday morning email going out to his his and team. And so half of the team got 12 words that were changed that were achievement words, things like, you know, thriving, successful, those types of things where the other one still, it was still a rah-rah email, right? It's, it's like getting the team pumped up. But at the end of the week, there was a big performance increase um, by those people that had the 12, you know, achievement words added into this. Wondering where, so achievement words being kind of those, I think of them almost more as abstract words, wondering how that fits into um, kind of some of your research research? Does it align? How would you kind of describe that that work? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like what, um, and sorry, I'm not familiar with that paper, but it uh, sounds quite interesting. But um, it, what it sounds like he did is he primed an identity. Yeah. Right. So he, he primed a motivation. He primed people to think about achievement. And because they were thinking more about achievement, because that construct was activated, um, people are more likely to behave in ways that were consistent with that, either because they wanted to see themselves as um, co- holding those desired traits and identities or just because they were more active. And so they um, were more likely to behave in sort of uh, active, consistent uh, ways. And so, uh, you know, language is so, is so powerful. It, we can even help people avoid bad things by, by using this similar idea, right? Rather than, you know, losing is bad, but being a loser, well, that's even, even worse. You know, <laughs> uh, cheating on a test, nobody wants to cheat on a test, but being a cheater, thinking of oneself as a cheater is, is even worse. And so research shows that, well, hey, when, when cheating would make me a cheater, I'm less likely to cheat. 
because I don't want to see myself that way. It, um, it's like that old campaign, don't be a, a litter bug, right? No one, no one wants to litter, but if littering would make me you know, hold this undesirable trait, well, now I'm really un- unlikely to do it. Oh, that's a great example. God goes goes back to my childhood in, in yeah. kind of a funky way. Yeah. But and it also totally drew me out of what I wanted to talk about next. So I'm just <laughs> going to go to I, I'm going to go to music because I'm curious about uh, have you have you done any work that sort of suggests that the lyrics of a song make a difference? Is the abstractness or concreteness of a song influence its ability to rise in the charts? Yeah, so so we didn't look at abstractness and concreteness uh, as, in in detail. One thing we did look at though is how similar uh, a song's words are to other songs, and or, or similar the themes are to other songs. And so so what do I mean by that? So if you think about your favorite song, um, uh, they are singing about uh, different themes or or ideas, right? So take Whitney Houston's famous, you know, "I Will Always Love You." Obviously, she's singing about love, uh, and that's one of the topics that she's singing about uh, in in that song. Uh, you know, other songs may sing about um, uh, different types of love. They may sing about, you know, dancing. They may sing about a variety, family, a variety of topics uh, or themes. Um, and so one of, I won't say early, but one of the early-ish investigations we did in this broader area of language was looking at whether the lyrics of songs help explain their success. And so we looked at thousands of songs over multiple years. Um, some of them did really well in the charts. Others did less well. And we looked at why. What about the lyrics made them successful? And what we found is that songs that sing about different things than their genres actually end up being more, more successful. So I'll give you an example. Oh. Um, take take um, Little Nas X's uh, Old Town Road, the song he's sort of familiar, f- uh, famous for, his first song. Uh, that was in some sense uh, a, a hip-hop song, right? Um, but in some sense, it was a country song. It was very different than what people were used to it. it as a country song, it mixed in themes of, of hip-hop. As a hip-hop song, it mixed in themes of country, um, and that was part of the reason that it was so successful. It was different. It was novel um, compared to what people were used to. And that that novelty drove uh, its success. And so uh, it's not just about the individual words um, that we we use. In some cases, it's how similar something is to other things that that drives its success. Is it the similarity or the distinctiveness? Because when you're we're talking about that, right, is it needs to be similar enough, but then distinctive apart from that, that optimal distinctiveness i think that mary uh, or, um, brewer talks about from Marilyn social brewer, identity yes. yeah yes yeah, yeah yeah and so um you know in in that study well, i would describe it as similarity it's just that the opposite of similarity is good atypicality is good being atypicality. less similar okay yeah. being, being less similar is good but you could ask well hold, hold on should we be completely dissimilar right a song that has nothing to do with the themes of, of the genre uh, and I, I would agree that that probably wouldn't be good, right? So as long as something uh, is at least touching on some of the themes of the genre, but doing it in a different way, um, uh, that's that's novel. I think at a certain point, if it's so different, people wouldn't even think it's uh, part of that genre anymore because it's it's so different from what people are, are used to. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Jonah Berger, thank you for being a, a second time guest on Behavioral Grooves. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You're always insightful. So We appreciate it so much. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Jonah, have a free-flowing conversation, and groove on whatever else comes into our magical minds. I like that. That was easy. It was easy. It was there. It was just out i you know i i didn't want to think too hard <laughs> no one does we we're, we're our brains are cognitive misers so that yeah, that's okay mine is this mising more than most so <laughs> there you go okay and, and it's a cog you know brains are are energy misers that's a is that a concrete way of saying that i don't know oh. are we doing some analogies around here i think I think we could really be get descriptive in this uh, in this grooving session. What do you think? Absolutely, we can. And let's start by actually talking about what the difference is between concrete and abstract, because that's mm-hmm. an important part of it, right? That this is a really, I think this is a really important takeaway for our listeners to be aware of the way that we talk, and so that that awareness can lead to actually more impactful speech, that you can become more influential and more provocative and more informative in the way that you speak by 
choosing the right words, choosing the most impactful words. That's words that's, matter. Let's just repeat that. Words matter. The choice of you, the words that you use in your written communication, in your spoken communication, make a difference in how people respond to them. This idea of concrete versus abstract, I think, is really powerful. And it's one of the big things that I want to take away from our conversation. But I think it's also a big, com you know, big takeaway uh, that people can get from reading the book. This idea that we can change how we if we use more concrete words in the right situations that we are going to have more impact on how people do it. Like the idea of buying my um brain shift journal, right? You mm -hmm. want to be concrete in how I talk about that. And hopefully that will increase people's likelihood that they're going to want to buy this fantastic 96-page uh, <laughs> daily journal for 13 weeks that covers all of these important behavioral science aspects about how you can achieve your goals and gives you a direct daily process for helping you achieve those. How does that, Mr. Holohan? I think that was pretty good. I think you did a nice job of avoiding abstractness and sticking with concreteness. Let, let's give, let, let's just review for listeners what abstract communication is though, right? We're talking about when we cluster two or three or four nouns in, an, um, in a sentence with an occasional adjective and we form this abstract phrase that, and by the way, we are, <laughs> We are often uh, we are guilty often. of abstract talking. Absolutely, because we, we like to string these ideas together. But when we use words, like Kurt, there are some specific words that, that Jonah talks about in the book, right? Well, are, actually, I think this is from uh, this is from other places, but I'm sure Jonah would probably agree with this aspect, concept, elements, you know, inputs, operation, resources, words that have meaning, but not very specific meaning. So obviously the idea of abstract conversation is that you're not defining. It's this idea of footwear versus the bright green Nike, you know, Air Jordans with the 18 laces on them. That's more concrete. So, well, so give an example. Let, let's actually go through an example. What, well, what that would was be, an example. It was that, that, you know, footwear versus bright got, green night. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the business world, though, give us an example. Yeah. So here's, here's an example. Actually, I'm stealing this from plainlanguage.gov. So if you want to go out, they actually have some additional pieces out there. I think it's really good. So instead of saying running our new facility will improve our system's performance, Say something like running database software, improve our system administration, more yeah. concrete, sp yeah. more specific. We hear that payoff like the, there, there's this payoff is improving our system administration is much better than just improving our performance. Improving is much more general. It's it's more abstract. Performance can refer to anything. And if we know the specific outcomes, right? Running database software will improve our system administration by 20% is even better. Even better. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so, and, go, oh, go I'm ahead. sorry. I was just going to give another example because they have another example oh, here. So oh, good. it's running Microsoft's database will improve our payroll administration. Sounds great, right? I, I could sentence. see that written in a, in a PowerPoint that I'm going to be presenting to the senior leaders to try to get them to say we should be using Microsoft's database, right? That yes. seems like an, something I would write. Seems like something many, many <laughs> others would write. Yes. Being more concrete, however, would be saying something like running Microsoft's database saves three hours printing the payroll report. Yeah. See, we get to that payoff. And that's what I really like about more concrete language. And it, uh, it, it's, it's more informative. It's more persuasive. It gives me, the listener, more insight into what's actually happening. And by the way, it's not easy to do. It's hard, right? It because is hard. our minds are cognitive misers and we look for the easiest way to communicate because the more calories we burn, the less efficient our mind is. So it's important for us to think about the listener rather than just thinking about our own calorie balance, I guess, if you will. Think about how much easier it will be for the listener to hear something like, Running Microsoft's database saves three hours printing the payroll report. That 
apps is so much more informative. It is significantly more informative to the listener than it is if we if we're more abstract. Right. So this concreteness, right? It's it's you know generally trying to make language either more concrete in certain situations or more abstract. So we can use abstract when we're trying to kind of instill people with a sense of awe where you you don't want that specific that specificity. You want them to be able to interpret things. Again, as Jonah talked about, you're presenting to, you know, investors and, you know, we're going to make this, uh, you know, app that gets people from point A to point B very easily versus we are changing transportation, you know, um, yeah. because all of a sudden our brains go broader and it's like more opportunity. And so when we're trying to inspire, uh, maybe less concrete, more abstract, but you know, you got to think is about both the how and the why, right? And understanding those pieces of that. That said, we've also, you know, we heard about self-identity and words, right? And how we, we can use self-identity as nouns rather than verbs to get people to take action. And I think that, that Jonah has some great examples of that. Yeah. What are those examples? Well, like, uh, do you go for runs or are you a runner? Like mm -hmm. there's a big difference there in, in a tiny little framing tiny little framing difference. There's a big difference in the impact that it has on us. If we think about ourselves as I go for runs versus I am a runner, those are identity uh, changers. Uh, the second half being strong identity. The first part, the I just go for runs is a really weak identity. And so again, when we communicate with, so with someone else and we're wanting to engage them, we want to influence them. Are we thinking about them and talking about them as just going for runs or are we thinking about them as a runner? The interesting piece here too, Tim, and I think we, and we didn't talk about this with Jonah, but this idea of using those noun versus verbs in our self-talk. So when I talk about myself, do I consider myself a runner or do I consider myself someone who goes running? This idea of framing, using language to help frame our self-identity I think is very powerful and it leads to this element of that cognitive dissonance that we talked about variety mm -hmm. of other things. And so we have to not have to, but our, the way that our brains operate is that when our actions and that self identity don't align, it leads to cognitive dissonance. And we feel that sense that feeling in our gut, that little, you know, worry that comes and ticks in our brains going, wait, you say you're a runner. And, but the last time you ran was three weeks ago. If you're a runner, you need to be running, right? You know, if you go for run, so you either change, uh, language can be used to help drive that motivation in order to get there. And that's really powerful when we think about it. This uh, reminds me of uh, conversations that you and I have had in the past, and astute listeners might actually connect this back to, I think we were talking about uh, self-identity and the way the words prime, uh, prime us, and you said, I'm a camper. And then my question was, well, when was the last time you went camping? <laughs> Right. There yes. was sort of a pause. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I know. I mean, I th we probably had that camping one. I know I've used this before, but I used to have in my bio that I'm a, I was a canoeist. I, I canoed and I'm like going, I, don't, I haven't canoed in <laughs> years, or at least I do. I do it like once a year as part of a family gathering and we canoe in the boundary waters. But if I was a canoeist, I would be going out canoeing on the weekends or, you know, a right. Thursday night, I'd go grab the canoe and we'd go. Um, so yeah, I own a canoe. <laughs> I have canoed, but I would not consider my canoeist, right? I think it's really interesting when we think about that self-talk in words and how that works. And I, part of that, and, and this goes for both self-talk, but also others is you can prime, right? You're, yes. you're basically yeah. priming. And so we brought up the, the Gary Latham's achievement word study that he did. And so if you want more information on that listeners, actually, uh, we talk about that in episode 314. Um, this idea of utilizing achievement words to drive business performance that this executive just replaced, or actually Gary replaced 12 words in a 120 some word uh, email that went out. So going back to what I said at the beginning, words matter, right? You can also talk about priming 
John Barge talks a lot about that. We've had him on a couple different times, but I know we talked about that in episode 319 too. So um, not those, they weren't too long ago that we had some uh, conversations about priming. So, And those are great episodes to go back and re-listen to um, as well. And I, I really don't have anything to add other, other than just to say, please check them out because priming with words is very powerful and, and very meaningful, both in self-talk, as Kurt said, and in the way that we, we speak with others. You know, lastly, Kurt, I was wondering if we could just talk about uh, the similarity versus distinct words. We, we mm-hmm. were talking about music a little bit. Yeah. And I just thought that that was a really cool part of the conversation with Jonah, in, in part because it does make me think about all the ways that music works on requiring both the similarity and distinctiveness at the same time. Yeah. That a new a new artist, you know, to break through really needs to be distinct in many ways, and at the same time, they kind of need to fit into uh, a model that we were already comfortable with, right? It took my brain to Marilyn Brewer's work, right? The idea, yes. the theory of yeah. optimal distinctiveness, and granted, she's talking about social groups and fitting in or between social groups. This idea that to fit in with what with a group. You want to make sure that you're conforming, right? But there's also this other part of us that wants to feel like we need to stand out. And so there's this optimal distinctiveness where you're, it's kind of the Goldilocks, you know, zone. You're not too, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. You're not too distinct, but you're not too vanilla bland, right? So (laughs) um, that I think is really kind of an interesting piece and it reminded me back of Marilyn Brewer's work. So, yeah. Uh, and of course in the, in the musical world, uh, just to, to kind of riff on that, if we let really great musical ideas just kind of sit in their genre with an existing and a primary audience, we only get that effect, but yeah. clever creative artists are able to take that and, and amp it up by bringing a fresh perspective, uh, maybe a fresh mix and bringing it to a new audience. And, and you and I have talked about this, that, um, Suzanne Vega with Tom's diner, yeah. which was this, it's a little acapella piece and we'll have a link to it in the, in the dun, show notes. Dun, you should dun, listen to dun, the original. Dun, 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 there it is. There yeah. it is. It, <laughs> and, and then that, the guy, that got remixed by, by several actually, or they, I think they call it remixes, but in a large way, it was just sampled. And I think the first one was 1990. Uh, with the the DNA DNA that these two British guys that just did a fantastic job. Yeah, and then um, they, they changed it, right? So what they did is a, uh, it was a well known song, but they took it and added more of a, uh, not hip hop. It's you know, the, the kind of it, instead of being so a cappello, they they put music behind it and more housey kind of stuff. Very it dance. is it is a bit of a house beat. Yeah, yeah there's and, definitely a house jam on it. And it's it. yeah. very very cool. And and for me, what you know, we talked about this prior to, to getting on the air here. I was thinking when you're talking about that, it was about um, Fallout Boy who sampled um, uh, the same song, Tom's yeah, Diner, for right? centuries. Yeah. You know, and and they just sample that dun 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 up at the beginning. And when you hear it, it's always whenever I hear that, it's like, oh, it's Tom's Diner. And then you go, oh wait, it's not. And but it brings you into the song. And I think again that optimal distinctiveness. I want to go back to. I mean, when we talk about all of this stuff, we you know, I think of Run DMC with their remix of Aerosmith's Walk This Way. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. how that was, yeah. and, and for many people in the 80s, I mean, there was this rap was something, you know, the me as a white, you know, teenage boy living in Iowa, it was far away, different, weird. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. But compelling, right? Well, but not, not necessarily oh, oh, no, not until... Rap, rap, until no. Like they did this cover of Aerosmith, Walk This right. Way. And Aerosmith joined them for and it's you know, and I can we can probably we could riff on this too, but I think it kind of it shot run DMC into the mainstream. And it also Aerosmith at that point was kind of you know, had been going through, you know, I think their sales, they weren't the same band and it kind of brought no. them back into um, you know, kind of big pop culture and doing different things. So it, it, it helped both of those groups because of this um, mixture of taking this really common, very, very famous song, walk this way and remixing it and bringing some of that 
um, distinctiveness to what was very similar. Yeah. Uh, well, just one more comment on Suzanne Vega and Tom's Diner. I, I happened to, through a friend of a friend of a kind of a friend, ended up having dinner with Suzanne and got <gasps> to talk to her about this and had uh, and just asked her, you know, what was it like for her to get that? And she, her reaction was like, well, gosh, it was there all along. Like in her mind, that, that beat was so strong. And of course she, she demonstrated that by performing it so perfectly. You know, if you listen to the original recording, she is dead on with rhythm. Like, it's almost as if there's a drummer in the background that you just mm -hmm. don't hear. She has a tremendous sense of rhythm. And she said, I heard that from the very beginning. So so the DNA remix was really super complimentary to her. Uh, to what kind she, of like what when I did. I did the little dun, dun, dun. I was like, just just like that, right? She's, she's almost that steady. good. Almost. Almost that good, yeah. Uh, well, you should offer her some lessons, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I'm I'm awful with this. Anyway, all right. I, I think with that we have to wrap this grooving session up because I I don't know where else we can go with that. So we yeah we we probably should. Groovers, be a part of the conversation with us, please. Talk about this episode. We would love to to just have any ideas about about Jonah and about his work, uh, or really any ideas around behavioral science. If you could engage us by following us on Twitter, you just be that bold person, the advocate, the the commenter, be the person who actually leaves the comment and writes a review and engages with us on any podcast app. But we would really love to have that conversation with you. Yeah. That's the that's a short story. Yeah. So with that, go out, use some magic words this week to find your groove. Mm -hmm.